Well, welcome to Mex Online Campus. The Gallup organization conducts a really interesting annual poll on American values and beliefs. They list 21 behaviors uh, that would be considered kind of like moral behaviors or just, you know, value-oriented behaviors. And they rank what is considered morally acceptable and morally wrong. In other words, they survey. So what do you think about this? Good, bad, indifferent, right, wrong. And they list these moral behaviors. The three most morally acceptable behaviors based on the last survey were birth control, drinking alcohol, and getting a divorce. Among the least acceptable behaviors were such things as cloning humans, suicide, and polygamy. But of all 21 behaviors, and it included things like, as I mentioned, drinking alcohol, divorce, gambling, smoking marijuana, having a baby outside of marriage, uh, gay or lesbian relations, doctor-assisted suicide, abortion, premarital sex, pornography, polygamy, suicide, cloning humans. The number one behavior that was almost universally seen as immoral, almost universally condemned, the one leading the list as the most reprehensible and offensive and immoral, the one act that a whopping 89% agreed was wrong was a married man or woman having an affair. So it shouldn't be a surprise that as we walk through some of the bad girls of the Bible, we would come to someone who did just that. We don't know her name, but her story, and particularly her interaction with Jesus as a result of her adultery, is easily one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. Uh, even those who know very little about the Bible, much less the Christian faith, I mean, her story is as familiar to our lives as Cinderella or the Three Little Pigs. Only this story, obviously, is no children's tale. And it actually happened. It's captured for us in John's biography of Jesus, so let me read it. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. He straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Okay, heard that story? Probably, or at least it triggered some familiarity. But I wonder if we know how dark it really was. We like to jump to the ending. All grace and forgiveness and dropped stones, no condemnation, all the judgmental accusers put in their place, and this shaking, cowering young girl comforted and you know by Jesus. But let's go back to understand the story and the life of this woman and the lessons we should learn from her life. It takes holding off on the ending a little bit because it is first a story of a moral train wreck, the one act that all of us universally condemn as reprehensible, along with a lot of other moral train wrecks attached to the event. And then, and only then, is it a story that has lessons to be learned. But unless you understand the darkness that drenches this story, you'll never understand the potential light that it can bring. So let's talk about the dark side of the story, because again, a lot of darkness. And let's use the clearest, most cut-to-the-chase word about that darkness, the darkness that had taken hold of multiple people, and it's the word sin. Not just mistakes, not just slip-ups, not just less-than-ideal choices, not just, oops, my bad. <laughs> We're going to talk about the dark side, so let's call it what it is. This was a series of card-carrying, unblushing, purposefully plotted sins. Let's walk through the ones that are in this story. First, we have the sin of the people who brought this woman to Jesus. They didn't have to bring her to Jesus. 
heaping shame and ridicule on her in front of everyone. They weren't trying to save her or help her or redeem her. They didn't care anything about her. They didn't care if she was beaten or stoned, exposed or humiliated. She was absolutely nothing to them. They were cruel. They were unfeeling. She was simply a pawn in their plans. That's why they didn't even bother bringing the man, if you notice, who was caught with her. They didn't really care about the act at all. They just wanted to trap Jesus. He threatened them on every front, threatened their position with the people, threatened their positions and prestige, and the religious establishment. But Jesus was wildly popular. So they needed to do something to make him unpopular with the people. Tear him down, tear down his message, tear down the way he threatened them. So they tried to set a trap, and she was the bait. And here was the trap. If Jesus said, yes, stone her, then he would have gotten in trouble with the Roman government, which was in power at that time because only they had the power to exercise capital punishment. They were the only ones that had that authority. But not only that, he would have also lost his reputation among the people as being this, this friend of sinners, someone who was trying to help them and rescue them and save them and, and have compassion on them, not the person who stoned them. But then if Jesus had said, okay, don't stone her, then he would have been accused of being light on sin, compromising, weak, someone who didn't really embrace God's law and holiness, a sham prophet, a religious fake, no spiritual fiber in him. They felt that either way, they had him on this. They felt they had him on her. So there was a conniving, heartless, manipulative sin of the people who brought this woman caught in the act before Jesus. Then there was the sin and the darkness of the people who caught her in the act. The Bible is very clear that she was caught in the act. And yes, you can take that at face value. That language is important because it was the basis for which they were making their legal claim. It meant that they had the evidence needed to convict her. And in the ancient Near Eastern culture of that day, uh, so that suspicious husbands couldn't just accuse their wives without reason, the law required testimony from two witnesses who saw the couple together. Not just together, but lying together, engaged in having sexual intercourse. Not only that, the two witnesses had to see this at the same time, at the same place. Now, that's a high <laughs> that's a high bar of evidence to achieve. So how could you reach that bar? Pretty much only one way. I mean, unless two people happen to just walk in on them unexpectedly together, you had to set the couple up. You had to know it was going to happen and then lie in wait and then burst in on them. But that's not all. The law also said that if you were to see someone about to sin in that way, which if you were lying in wait for the setup, you would have seen it, it was your responsibility as a caring and compassionate person to say something to them to try and prevent them from doing it, to keep them from pursuing the act, which obviously didn't happen. So the witnesses and whoever else was involved in setting her up for the witnesses sinned. Then you have the sin of the man who was having sex with her. If they were caught in the act and she was busted, then he was busted too. They would have had to have dragged her away from his arms, something he didn't seem to resist too much. In fact, he seemed to have just fled the scene and left her to whatever was going to happen. They obviously let him go, didn't pursue him. They had what they wanted. He wasn't needed for the trap, but he certainly was part of the darkness. Finally, we have the sin of the woman herself. And, you know, she did sin badly, not just because she had sex with someone she shouldn't have and was caught in the act, but since the penalty being asked for was stoning, that tells us she was probably engaged to be married and was having sex with someone who was not her fiance. Because stoning was the penalty for an engaged person who was unfaithful to their fiance. Now, unfaithful wives, once already married, could also be sentenced to death, but the law did not specify that it had to be stoning. Here, they said she had to be stoned. And the only thing in the law where it said they had to be stoned was if she was engaged and was sleeping with someone who wasn't her fiance. That was just a nasty betrayal of trust and hence at a pretty deep streak of wanton promiscuity. 
So because it was considered adultery of the worst kind to be betrothed and be unfaithful, engaged and be unfaithful at the earliest stage of the marriage relationship, stoning was called for. The idea of stoning was twofold, to rid the community of someone whose sin was so brazen that it tore the fabric of the community apart, and second, to send a message far and wide that this was a line no one should ever cross. So it was meant to be a deterrent. But who really deserved to be stoned here? Who deserved to die? Who had engaged in heinous, premeditated, purposeful pursuit of sinful behavior before a holy God holding him in contempt with their behavior? All of them. So how did Jesus wade into all of this darkness? Well, first, he dealt with the people holding the rocks. So let me read that part again. He straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. The first thing Jesus did with the darkness of the scene was to expose it in the lives of those who were holding the stones ready to kill her. He essentially said, fine, if, if, if you're without sin, if that's, if that's true of you, stoner. But there was a bit more to it than that. In the original Greek language in which this was written, in which we translate into English, there's this idea that it wasn't just, hey, anyone who is perfect, who has their act completely together, throw the first stone. It was actually more specific than that. It was more along the lines of anyone who is not guilty of this same kind of sin, you know, the sin of adultery or adulterous kind of things, throw the first stone. And at that, they still walked away. And here's why they were so convicted by Jesus. The religious establishment of Jesus' day was entirely bound up in legalism, and so were the people who followed that establishment. Do's and don'ts, rituals and practices, laws and codes, but absolutely nothing about the heart, nothing about the inner world, nothing about who you were when no one was looking. In fact, they used their legalism to cover up their, their bad behavior, uh, making it as though it wasn't even seen as bad at all. For example, they would find ways around the laws and rules they put in place to pursue whatever it is they wanted to pursue and then pat themselves on the back for being holy and above reproach because they gamed the legalistic religious system. And so they were not sexually immoral technically. So when it came to sexual misconduct, all that mattered to them was that if you were married, you didn't commit adultery. That was it. You follow that one airtight rule as legalistically as possible and you're fine, which meant premarital sex, postmarital sex, all of that went unchecked because all that mattered was keeping the letter of the law on adultery, that you weren't unfaithful to your wife with another woman. And that carried over into how they treated adultery itself. Since adultery was the one sin you had to avoid, they made it really easy to avoid it by making it really easy to divorce without penalty. In other words, easy to get out of the marriage almost instantly so that you could go and have sex with who you wanted to have sex with and avoid the adultery label. For example, they made it so that a man could divorce his wife with just a written notice, you know, just a note. Uh, and he Literally, he could just write out, I don't want to be married anymore. Boom. And it was done. And that was that. And it could be over anything. I mean, you know, anything. You could divorce a woman in Jesus' day for a badly cooked meal. You could divorce a woman in Jesus' day simply because you found somebody else more physically attractive. And what was behind it was often nothing more than the desire to commit adultery, to pursue whatever you wanted sexually, but to technically avoid the adultery label. So here's how it worked. They told themselves that sex before marriage is okay. After all, it's not like you're cheating on your spouse, right? You don't have a spouse. Then they said, and hey, if you aren't married, but the other person is, you're still okay because you aren't married. And if you are divorced or widowed, oh, well, I mean, have at it. You can do whatever you want because it's not like you're going to lose your virginity or something, much less cheat on anybody. And again, no marriage to worry about. And even if you are married, you can engage in sexual thoughts, sexual fantasies, sexual activities, just as long as there's not full sexual intercourse because that's all that matters. And on and on that kind of game went. Anything to game the system. Anything to legalistically avoid adultery while pursuing wanton sexual immorality, whether married or not. 
Now, you know, that's interesting. That kind of spirit hasn't changed, really. I, I was recently read an article in the Los Angeles Times about how sex tourism is just booming in Indonesia. And when I read that headline, I thought, well, that's interesting because Indonesia, I mean, that's a Muslim country. It's, in fact, it's got the largest population of Muslims in the world, and Muslims don't go along with, you know, that kind of sexual sin or, or adultery. So how is it working? Why is sex tourism bo booming in, of all places, Indonesia? Because adultery is forbidden under Islamic law. Here's how. The people brokering the women through trafficking offer Muslim men a temporary marriage to the person they will be having sex with. The agent who brokers the deal arranges for the man to wed the woman, or often young girl, in a small ceremony under Islamic law in the hotel where they meet. At the end of their planned time together, the man gets on a plane to wherever he came from, where he unilaterally ends the marriage by saying the Arabic word for divorce, talik. That's all he has to say. He just utters the word talik. That's it. He just has to say the word. The women being trafficked enter into marriage after marriage, all ending after the sexual tryst, all to avoid the technicalities of adultery. What Jesus did was to expose all of that in the hearts and minds of those men holding the rocks. In essence, he said, so you want to stone her for committing adultery? Fine. Any of you who have never played fast and loose with adultery, have at it. Jesus knew the truth. So did they. And whether it was seeing the girl cowering before them or hearing the words come from Jesus himself, they just couldn't do it. The conviction ran too deep. The truth was too real. But Jesus wasn't finished. Let's remember what else he did. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Here, Jesus did one more thing. He dropped his stone. Not because he was guilty too. He was the only one who wasn't. He was the only one who could have brought judgment justly. No, he dropped his out of compassion, out of mercy, out of grace. But then as Jesus Always did. He added truth into the mix. Truth about what her next step needed to be. In light of that grace, she needed to leave her life of sin. Change her ways. Stop living the way she had been living. Uh, to turn away from sin and to turn toward God. So, did she? We don't know. That's the last of her story in the Bible. But that doesn't mean she doesn't leave us with, with some incredibly important life lessons, because she does. Ones that echo throughout time and land right into our own lives, or should. And here they are. There's at least four big ones. First, life change often only happens when we are fully revealed, meaning exposed. That isn't pleasant. Because the very idea of being revealed or exposed is that we weren't planning on it. We didn't do the exposing. Someone else or something else did. A secret affair suddenly isn't so secret. A hidden addiction rears its ugly head. Patterns of abuse kept hidden erupt in separation and divorce. An audit finds a pattern of embezzlement. A sting operation results in an arrest. Over and over again, we've all seen deeply entrenched shadow lives brought to the surface in ways that suddenly radically expose a person's actions. And it's like their worst nightmare. But there are times it is the only way we can experience the depth of life change we so desperately need. This woman dragged before Jesus was sinned against in the process. That is without a doubt. But she made her bed. Pun intended. She wasn't innocent. And I would wager that until that moment, she never saw her life the way she needed to. She never saw her darkness, her choices, her inner world. There's, a, there's just this difference 
between coming to the point where you personally, privately confess your sins to God and when you are dragged, kicking and screaming into the light and revealed, confronted with your sin that you knowingly, purposefully kept in the shadows and never had any intention of confessing to anyone or owning before anyone. If anything, if confronted about it, you would have denied it with every fiber of your being which is why sometimes having it chosen for us, thrust upon us, is the only way we'll ever see the light. And while, and, and while that's a life principle, here's the real life lesson. Don't wait for that to be what happens. You know your sin. You know your shadow life. You know what could be exposed. Don't wait for it to come out in the most gut-riching way imaginable. If she did choose Christ at all this, I've got a feeling that she would say, that was a terrible day. I was terribly wronged, but what I did was terribly wrong. And while it was awful what happened to me, God used it to expose me in ways that I really needed to be exposed and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world because I don't think I would have done it any other way. Well, a second life lesson is that when our sin is revealed to God, whether we do it ourselves or it's done for us, God is willing to meet us with grace. We won't receive the condemnation we expect, the condemnation that we deserve, not if we're truly broken and repentant and filled with remorse and really wanting to get right with God. This is so important. So many of us keep our shadow lives hidden because we fear bringing them out into the light, not just because of people, but because of God. We think there will only be condemnation and judgment instead of forgiveness and restoration. Here we have a woman who committed habitually a sin that is the most deplorable of sins, at least when ranked against others in our day. The vote is in. One so bad it called for stoning in her day. And Jesus dropped his stone. And isn't that the cry of our heart, what we secretly hope really will happen? to experience forgiveness and grace and acceptance and mercy and loving kindness and second chances. Well, that brings us to a third life lesson. That grace, while real, is not cheap. Uh, don't forget what it took for Jesus to be able to drop that stone. It's not that she wasn't guilty. She was. Jesus dropping the stone meant she wasn't going to have to pay for her guilt. She wasn't going to have to pay for her sins. And here's why. He would be taking her stoning himself. On the cross, he would pay for her adultery and mine and yours. He didn't offer grace to her with a wave of his hands, but with nails in his hands. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor during the time of the Third Reich who worked for the underground resistance against Hitler. He was eventually captured and then executed in a Nazi concentration camp. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, which is considered one of the classics of Christian devotion. And in it, he talks about this idea of cheap grace. Let me just read you some of his words. Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, the consolation of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace without price, grace without cost. Through such grace, the world finds a cheap covering for its sins. No contrition is required, still less any real desire to be delivered from sin. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Grace without discipleship, grace without the cross. But real grace, he writes, is costly. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Cheap grace is Christianity without discipleship, and Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ, which is no Christianity at all. So when Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, that was grace. When he then said, now go and leave your life of sin, that's what kept it from being cheap grace. That's what added the truth she needed to hear about what her next steps needed to be if she were to walk in that grace, accept that grace, live in that grace, receive forgiveness and a new beginning through that grace. Which brings us to the final life lesson from her life to ours. 
Well, we have no idea what happened after this encounter with Jesus. No idea what happened after this nightmare day. I mean, can you imagine this nightmare day that would have started for her like any other day? She had, could never have, in her worst nightmare, imagined how that day would have unfolded. But ended being dragged from a bed in the middle of a sexual encounter, taken to none other than Jesus himself, before a crowd of jeering men calling for her death, and then finding herself standing alone before Jesus, being offered grace and truth, forgiveness, and a challenge to live a new life. We do know that if she embraced what Jesus offered, it wasn't going to be like a light switch. You know, off and then on, bad and then good, broken and then instantly fixed. That's not the way it works with most people. It's not the way God works with most people. Instead, it's the invitation into a relationship, the start of a journey, a journey that Eugene Peterson once described as a long obedience in the same direction. The idea of journey really is key. The truth is that when you give your life to Christ, your eternal destiny is altered. There's a radical reorientation of priorities. There's a new life purpose. There's the power and work of the Holy Spirit coursing through your life. But rather than instant liberation from every bad habit or character flaw you've ever possessed, what takes place is more like the landing of an army, which begins then routing out the enemy as it makes its way inland. The event of becoming a Christian really is best seen as the beginning of the long journey of life change that God wants to direct and guide and invest in over the course of your life. And whether she took Jesus up on it or not, that is what he offered her. As Liz Curtis Higgs writes, he wasn't sending her away at the end of all this. He was setting her free. What she did with that freedom, we don't know. But that is what he offers each of us. So don't wait for your shadow life to be brought into the light. Bring it to God yourself. Drink deeply from the well of grace that will be there for you, realizing it's not a cheap drink, but one that costs Jesus his life and demands yours in return. And then begin the journey with him, a journey that really is a long obedience in the same direction. Well, we have one last bad girl of the Bible to get to. After Delilah and Sapphira, the woman at the well and the medium of Endor, Jael, and today the woman caught in adultery, there's one more name to add to the list. So far, they've been an assortment of being bad to the bone, bad for a moment, bad for a season, part of a bad moon rising, bad but for a good reason. For our last bad girl of the Bible, we're going to look at someone who fills the category bad and proud of it. I doubt you would recognize her name, but many of you will be familiar with what she orchestrated to take place. It was heinous, and she didn't even blush. Well, until then, let me pray for you. Father, I, I pray that we would take the life lessons from this woman so seriously, to look at our shadow lives with honesty, to not wait till we're exposed, but to expose ourselves to you, seeking your grace, knowing how much it costs you, beginning journey of life with you. That's my prayer. I pray for my ongoing journey, and I pray for those who have yet to even begin it, because they've never even tasted and come to you for that grace, and I pray they will. Thank you for this story. Thank you for the power of it. Thank you for what it so powerfully demonstrates about how you feel toward us and what our life can be like in spite of our sin. I pray all that in Jesus' name.